Hey everybody, AJ here for the Mighty Glue Stick channel, also known as the Monster Guy, but not to be confused with a large can of energy drink. Continuing on with a series on dragons, arguably the most complete detailing of Dungeons and Dragons draconic lore on YouTube, but with plenty more to cover, believe you me. Mercury Dragons, native to the Forgotten Realms, another new dragon introduced in the Dragons of Faerun campaign supplement, and one I have some creative ideas for, those of you who set your games in Karatur, or visit there, or those who have monks and monastic traditions in your campaign, more on that later. Physically, they are sleek, lean, almost serpentine and built for speed with long whip-like tail. They hatch with the same sort of coloration as a young silver dragon, but as they age the scales become smoother, almost seamless, and go to a bright silver uh, and then onto a chrome, almost mirror reflective finish that can be dazzling to behold. Particularly when they let loose with their impressive breath weapon or make use of their radiant spell powers. The scales are smaller than most other dragons and fit together very well, but they are no less protected than any other dragon. Perhaps it's their fondness for taking on humanoid form that influences the smooth hide. Perhaps it's their habit of layering in tight and twisting lava tubes and cave networks and high alpine peaks. In fact, they have the amazing ability to polymorph into completely amorphous form, to better squeeze into inaccessible caverns and to escape nearly any physical confinement. They have a sleek head with a long pointed snout with short horns curving forward from behind the lower jaw and larger horns curving backward from behind the upper jaw and eyes. This gives them a haughty appearance, particularly when they rear their head back on their long neck to look down their nose at some tiny humanoid who is daring to address them. In polymorphed form, where they spend the majority of their time, they are wildly predictable in their appearance. They can appear as anyone. They delight, in fact, in taking on new guises and deliberately confuse everyone they deal with by never showing up in the same form twice until they kind of get bored with the sport of it or the situation is serious enough where they forget this game. Mercury dragons are fast moving and highly whimsical. When they speak, which is fairly often, the words come out so quickly that many creatures can't keep up. Mercury dragons are known for making a cha and changing decisions frequently. You could say that they have a textbook mercurial attitude that is as reliable as the situation is interesting. As soon as the things get dull, they're out of there. They're invariably of chaotic alignment. The vast majority of them are good. Some lean towards neutral, very rarely will they be of evil nature. They are more likely to unintentionally do harm out of their own narcissism and neglect just as they get bored so easily and have a compulsion to see new things and follow new ideas and where their action, action is and thus they have a great difficulty in forming any real attachment to people and places and such. Their hoard is a wild collection of wondrous items, rare inventions, tomes of puzzles and eccentric prose, limericks, rare maps of exotic location, works of fantasy fiction, and trophies of rare and fabulous creatures. Um, also, it should be noted that their hoard, the lair itself, is a highly dangerous environment for humanoids because the preferred diet of mercury dragons is metals, particularly rare and exotic metals, most of which are highly toxic. Spend any long period of time unprotected in a Mercury Dragon's lair and you may very well lose your mind or your life. This also inspires me to link them with a mythical alchemical traditions of Karatua and Alexis of Immortality. More on that in a moment. Because they share the same habitat as Red Dragons, uh, they're Mercury Dragon's worst enemies really. The larger reds have the advantage in one-on-one -on -one confrontation, so Mercury Dragons usually try to evade them through their superior speed. On the ground, these dragons can hit speeds of 60 feet, and that is without applying the dash action. In the air, they move at 200 feet. Mercury Dragons usually stay on friendly terms with any silver dragons living near them. They may team up from time to time when a red dragon threatens one or the other, which I'd imagine would be frequently. The Silver Dragon, however, usually considers Mercury Dragons tiresome company at best due to their manic behaviour and capricious natures. As per usual for Metallic Dragons, Mercury Dragons have two breath weapons. One is a viciously toxic cone of gas they can blast out to 60 feet, requiring a constitution saving throw to take half damage. Keep in mind, the dragon is immune to this toxin, and will most likely use this attack in a confined space such as its lair. As a DM, it's perfectly reasonable for this toxin to become an environmental hazard for the duration of the fight, as it's got nowhere to go, it doesn't dissipate very quickly in a non-ventilated space. Also, you could rule that it impairs vision in the area. 
even for the dragon. Mercury dragons also have highly toxic blood, and they're clever enough to use this against their attackers, purposefully spraying them from open wounds, uh, with a similar but much weaker effect than their poisonous breath weapon. Uh, the, you know, the opponents don't have to inhale it, but they can certainly splash into their mouth or their eyes. However, the primary attack of a Mercury Dragon is their ability to release a 120 foot line of pure light. This is blindingly bright and burns anything it touches, dealing fire damage. It also counts as a radiant energy. Also, adult Mercury Dragons who are standing within a bright light, such as under the noonday sun, can use their highly reflective wing membranes to reflect the light in a focal beam, similar to a magnifying glass. A single target within 30 feet can be blinded for up to 5 rounds, unless they make a hasty dexterity saving throw to dive out of the way, because it's bright enough to dazzle someone even when their eyes are closed. It can reduce the intensity of its breath weapon as well, to merely emit a cone of light up to 60 feet for 3 rounds. They are immune to poison, as mentioned, and immune to fire but take double damage from cold attacks. They're also immune to any effect that would blind or dazzle them and gain advantage on any save versus hypnotic pattern type spell magic. They're adept practitioners of sorcery, but have the innate power to create spell-like effects of mirror image, telekinesis, project image, prestidigitation, that sort of thing. One thing always to remember with uh, Mercury Dragons is that they're highly creative, quick to change tactics and will usually find innovative and unusual ways to use spells and attacks and combinations to devastate their opponents. So have some tricks up your sleeve as a dungeon master, really catch your players if they're taking things for advantage, uh, for granted. They prefer to lair in cave networks that have uh, east facing cave mouths where they can bask in the sunlight, particularly morning sunlight, plus they have numerous sunbathing spots throughout their chosen territory which can be just about anywhere, but most frequently in mountain ranges, both volcanic and high alpine peaks just above this, uh, just below the snow line. They range across the whole of Toril, including Karatur. Now, taking the idea of an eccentric shape-shifting dragon, supernaturally inclined to seek out and consume an exotic metals, along with a fondness for all sorts of equally exotic meats, they'll go to extraordinary lengths to sample a meat they've never eaten before, and delight in chasing down small game that is particularly hard to catch. And yes, this would include displacer beasts, but not blink dogs. Uh, place them in the Far East, in the lands of Karatur. Add in the Taoist alchemy tradition. Um, if you go to Google and search words uh, Nidan and uh, Wydan, I'll put the spelling of those in the doobly doo below, which mean uh, internal elixir or external elixir. Um, and to give you some background, both these philosophies and practices uh, essentially involve making alchemical ingredients and combining them. In the case of Wyadan, it's heat in a heating crucible, and in Nyadan, the alchemist's own body is where they combine the, um, the elements, so they're ingesting things. In both Wyadan and Nyadan, the practice is variously said to grant transcendence, a state um, by which Sucks expressions is joining with the Tao. Uh, immortality, usually meant as a spiritual condition. Longevity, healing, either in a broad sense or with regard to specific illnesses or ailments. And in particular in Wydan, communication with the gods of the celestial pantheon and protection from spirits, demons and other malignant entities. The main names of the elixir are uh, Huandan, or revert, reverted elixir. And especially in the internal branch, Jindan or Golden Alexa, gold represents the state of constancy and immutability beyond the change of and transiency that characterizes the cosmos. As for Dan, um, Alexa, this word means essence. In other words, the reality principle or true, true nature of entity, its most basic and significant element, quality or property. On the basis of this term, the authors of alchemical texts call their tradition the way of the Golden Alexa, uh, Jindan Zaldal. So this um, can be adapted to Dungeons and Dragons, well, magic, alchemy, rare and exotic chemicals, toxin, monstrous body parts, bizarre rituals and formulas, mischievous dragon sages, ancient masters, whole monastic orders dedicated to affecting one elixir or another. It's an incredibly rich source of folklore. 
myth, legend, and oh-so-ripe plunder for very involved and classic quests for your game. The search for a mystical artifact-level potion that can confer freedom from physical aging or restore the soul of a repentant lich, can turn a rakshasa into a diva, regrow severed limbs, permanently sanctify anointed objects or locations, you name it. There is a way to spin a tale around it using ancient eastern alchemy and mercury dragons, also contemplative and wise gold dragons and reclusive, very grouchy, but extremely knowledgeable mist dragons. Oh yes, certainly add them into the mix. Hope that inspires some ideas. It certainly gets my imagination fizzing. I'll be back very shortly with another video, this one on the steel dragon.